Hey guys, uh, Woodruff here. So let's talk today. Um, this is my long lecture over cardiac disorders where we're going to be breaking down hypertension, coronary artery disease, and chronic stable angina. So these are three big hitters that you're going to see often in um, test questions, in CLEX, and in real life. Um, so they're definitely ones you want to get to know. And it's cardiac, so I hope you're already excited like I am. Let's get started. All right. So first let's talk about hypertension. Oh, and by the way, so um, as my uh, beginning spiel, this is my long lecture. So if you wanted shorter videos, I have other videos, just go to my playlists under unit two for cardiovascular and you can find more um, shorter videos if you want more short, sweet, simple to the point. This is my long lecture for those who maybe missed my lecture, wanted more and then aren't able to attend my lecture, et cetera, to help to bring stuff together. Anyway, so hypertension. Um, hypertension is elevated blood pressure. Um, what do you call it? Uh, most people are aware, you can always remember in the name, it's hypertension. There is a lot of tension. So um, there's a lot of tension where? In my blood vessels. And there are two types of hypertension. There's what's known as primary and secondary. So primary hypertension is where, um, and this is what most people have, it's where they have high blood pressure um, with no known cause. Um, so, um, you know, like in other words, it's what we call idiopathic pathic or we're not really sure why they have high blood pressure. Um, there can be contributing factors like they have too much fight or flight, like their sympathetic nervous system is overactivated, which is very common in today's world because we live in a stressful world. Um, that people work too much, don't rest or sleep enough, et cetera. Um, hormones um, are associated with primary hypertension, having too much salt intake, and then some of those lifestyle things like obesity, um, sedentary lifestyle, having high cholesterol, um, anything that affects the blood vessels like diabetes and smoking can also um, lead to hypertension and then excessive alcohol use as well. So the difference between primary and secondary is pretty much primary is like, hey, I have this type of hypertension. We don't really know why we can try to modify it, but you're always going to have it. Whereas secondary hypertension, there's like an identifiable cause that we can actually reverse um, sometimes. So it'd be things like, hey, I have hypertension while I'm pregnant. And, um, you know, um, that I, once I have that baby, then the hypertension is going to go away. Um, but um, that's really the difference there is, is that with secondary, um, uh, pretty much there's a cause that we can modify and actually like the hypertension can get better. Whereas with primary hypertension, it's not going to get better. Um, we can, man well, it's going to get better with medications and lifestyle changes, but it's not going to go away. Where with secondary, like, you know, you remove the problem, like for example, cocaine, stop using cocaine. It definitely can lower my blood pressure. And I'm not saying I use cocaine, by the way. Um, I, when anytime I use myself as an example, I'm not talking about um, uh, my own experience, just in case um, for those that uh, maybe do not get my sense of humor or my sarcasm through these videos. Um, so, but um, again, like treat, treating the kidney or liver disease, um, removing tumors, treating the endocrine disorders that can lower the blood pressure, um, but um, you know, it can actually make it better. Um, it's like pretty much there's something else in the body that's leading to the high blood pressure. We're primary. We don't really know what's leading to the high blood pressure, but here's some factors that may be contributing to it. So other factors related to hypertension are going to be older age, age greater than 50. Um, for females, it's going to be age greater than 64 because we live longer. So therefore, we're at risk for everything after a certain age because we live longer. Uh, male gender, especially those, those that are young, adulthood or middle age, um, close family members that have hypertension, um, being African-American ethnicity. And this is super key because um, you'd be surprised, you know, being someone who works in cardiovascular ICU, I can't tell you how many times I've seen, you know, young African-American males, like in their late twenties, early thirties with things like, um, uh, you know, aortic aneurysms um, and other cardiovascular disease. There's, there's a lot that genetics, like you can't outrun your genetics. And so just never judge a person by their age, um, you know, always look at these other factors because there's a lot of times that um, regardless of um, what do you call it, um, how healthy they may be and they may not have other risk factors, the, the genetics, again, you can't outrun it. I had a friend that had um, high cholesterol um, and, um, you know, when he was in his, like by the time he was 25, like his cholesterol levels were out of control and it was all family history and he ended up having to go on medications and it's good that they caught it early. Um, so it's just good to know that you, it's good to know as a nurse what risk 
risk factors are and that sometimes it might not even be. So like, don't always just assume like, oh, they must lead a really unhealthy lifestyle. Sometimes genetics, again, just um, really uh, makes it hard on a person. I'm um, also having lower socioeconomic status can uh, be a risk factor for hypertension. And I know sometimes um, it can get confusing, but like you have to think about some of it's going to be lifestyle. If you have, um, you know, a lower socioeconomic status, you may have less access to certain resources like regular health care um, or, um, you know, um, a, a better diet, exercise, stuff like that as well. Try this again. Whoop. All right. So complicated graph and lots of words, you know, you're sitting here, you're like, oh God, what's she about to talk about? So let's talk about um, the, the factors that um, affect hypertension. And you may be wondering why I'm going into this, like, why do I need to know this? Um, but this is really important because these are going to help guide treatment. So we need to know what are, who are the players when it comes to blood pressure? What makes up my blood pressure? Because those are what we're going to alter in order to treat blood pressure. In other words, like the medications we give are going to um, alter these factors. And by altering these factors, it can treat that high blood pressure. So we need to know like what affects blood pressure? What are the things that come into play? Um, so some of the things that come into play are how fast the heart is beating. Um, we have to make sure that it's being fast enough to get blood out. So like if I have a very slow heart rate, I'm going to have less cardiac output or blood pumped out. Um, so I'm going to have more low blood pressure. Um, so like if my heart is beating um, slow, like, you know, like let's say I have bradycardia, then um, I'm not um, squeezing as many times per minute. So I'm not going to get as much blood out of my heart. Um, also if I'm beating too fast, then I'm, I'm not having time to fill. So like we want, we don't want the heart beating too slow or too fast. If I'm beating too slow, I'm not getting as, as much out. If I'm beating too fast, I don't have time to fill. So I can't plump blood out. And so, um, you know, there's a really like fine range there for where we want the heart rate to be. Um, also if I'm, uh, if my heart is pumping faster, but not too fast, um, you know, I can be pumping more blood out. So if I have like a fast heart rate, sometimes I can have higher blood pressure. Um, but keep in mind if my, if I have, um, it, the body responds, like when my heart is beating, um, too slow, or it's not feeling like I'm not getting enough cardiac output out, it responds by constricting my blood vessels. So um, I know you're probably thinking about why am I talking about blood pressure, like being low or cardiac output being low? It's because like the body responds to that. So if I have a low heartbeat, I have less blood coming out, my blood vessels are going to constrict and say, hey, I need more pressure here. Um, so we have to think about these things about is the heart beating too fast um, and not having time to fill or too slow. We also want to think about the heart muscle? Can it squeeze? Like how much, um, like, does it have a good contractility? Um, how much blood is the heart able to actually pump out? Because um, let's say that I'm even like beating at a good rate and rhythm and stuff like that. If I don't have a good contraction, I'm not going to be able to get blood out in order to have blood pressure. I need so much muscle squeeze in order to get that blood out. Um, volume is a big thing. Um, you have to think of this as like a tank of gas. I know gas is super expensive right now. Um, so um, this may be a touchy subject for some, but hopefully it won't be too touchy for you. So <laughs> this analogy, um, but um, with volume, think about how much blood is available to be pumped. So um, if I have low volume, let's say I'm dehydrated or I've had fluid losses or I'm just low on volume, um, you know, my blood pressure is going to be more on the low end. So less volume is less pressure. And on the other end, if I have too much volume, it can contribute and make my blood pressure higher because volume is pressure, volume is stretch. Um, and then there's uh, another factor um, that comes into um, high blood pressure is what's called SVR or systemic vascular resistance. And what this is, is this is how constricted my blood vessels are. And so the demonstration I usually do in class for this is imagine, um, uh, what do you call it? Imagine you were trying to pour, pour a um, gallon of milk into a tiny funnel. Um, and so regardless of how, like, let's say I have good volume, like I have a big old gallon of milk and I'm able to pour it easily, like my heart's pumping well, if I have a tiny funnel that I have to pour this, you know, aka blood into, um, it, it's going to, it's going to be harder and there's going to be more resistance that the heart has to overcome to get that blood through those vessels. So the same thing happens in the heart when in the left ventricle, when the body is pumping blood out to the rest of the body, if there's these really narrow constricted vessels, the heart has to work super hard to push out against them. We talk about this more in heart failure too, but um, the point here is, is that that can affect my blood pressure. If I'm really 
constricted and narrow. Um, uh, and I'm going to talk about this more later, but a lot of people think high blood pressure means like a lot of volume and a lot of flow, but sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it means we're just really narrow, like barely where blood can barely flow. So to kind of sum this up, and hopefully you haven't gotten too confused, um, but the you don't have to understand this deep in depth, but just understand this is what we're going to do. So if I have high blood pressure, some of the things I can alter, I can alter my heart rate. I can give medications that alter my heart rate so that, um, uh, what do you call it? I'm able to um, get good volume and stuff out to the rest of my body. I can um, give medications that can help um, with my heart squeeze if I needed that. That's more with heart failure. Um, I can give medications that alter volume. If I have too much volume um, uh, and that's what's causing my high blood pressure, I can give medications like diuretics that can help to manage that blood pressure. And then almost nine out of like 10 of the drugs that we're going to give um, for high blood pressure decrease that systemic vascular resistance. In other words, they decrease that vasoconstriction. Um, so these are all how we treat blood pressure is through managing these things. But this is the equation for um, blood pressure. And I have a um, I have a thing on my actual like PowerPoint, like the equation for good blood pressure is good heart squeeze, adequate volume, and uh, a normal amount of beats and not too much resistance. So normal blood pressure used to be like 120 over 80, but now they're actually saying they want it to be less than 120 and less than 80. So they like it like one teens over 70s. Um, and they start like, you know, I'm not saying that if you have blood pressure and you're like, you're running 120 over 80 and you're like, oh my God, I'm hypertensive. Um, but just know that they're starting to want like, um, the blood pressure to be lower than I guess what they used to want it to be. Um, it's always good to know when you go in and you're taking care of a patient with hypertension, what's their normal, where do they normally lie or like kind of where do they hang around? Um, because everyone's going to be a little bit different when it comes to that. Um, so just look at the time here. Um, other things to consider here um, is just that um, I, I'm bringing this up because this recent, like this not too long ago changed. So um, generally we like, we like to manage people in the one teens over seventies. And when you're giving medications and things like that, um, you want to consider that even if their blood pressure is one teens over seventies, we still give their medicines because we want to keep them and maintain them around that area. Um, but every patient's different. So there are some people we might maintain them at a different level. So it's always good to talk to your um, doctor or, and um, see Kind of what they want the patient to be around because some people we maintain them at a little bit of a higher rate. Um, so what does this patient look like? Um, they usually look normal. So a lot of patients with hypertension, you're not even going to know like, hey, um, there's um, something abnormal or not going, um, going on here. People usually don't come in and they're like, oh, my hypertension is killing me. Um, and this is the hard thing with hypertension is that there are no symptoms usually. It's a silent killer. Um, in other words, um, um, you know, most people, they don't experience, um, they don't come in with any symptoms. It takes your hypertension getting very severe before you're going to start complaining about or having symptoms um, with it. And so um, usually, um, for most patients with hypertension, the only thing that's abnormal is their actual blood pressure. They come in and they're like, oh, my blood pressure is high. I didn't even know. And so this is why it's a silent killer. And this is what leads to a lot of problems in hypertension, because, you know, it's one thing with, um, you know, if you have a health problem, like let's say I get headaches. Um, if I have I get headaches, I have a lot of motivation to get treatment because I have pain. I'm uncomfortable. I want that symptom treated, but it's really hard with hypertension. If all I have is a number on a screen that says it's abnormal and you're telling me it's going to cause problems, but I'm not feeling bad. I feel all right. Where's my motivation to get treatment? Where's my motivation to take medications, which have lots of side effects and are, um, can lead to some very uncomfortable side effects. Where's my motivation to, um, you know, to take that, um, when I am, um, feeling okay. And that's the hard thing. A lot of times with hypertension is compliance. And we'll talk about that. So if hypertension does get severe, they can have fatigue, dizziness, like heart palp, oh, goodness gracious, heart palpitations, angina and dyspnea, which is like chest pain um, and um, shortness of breath, stuff like that. But that's really severe. Like they would have to have very high blood pressure. Most people, nine out of 10 people feel nothing with their high blood pressure. Um, so that's something definitely to know as the nurse, like you're going to assess this patient. And if they're having any of these severe complications, you're going to be like, uh oh, they're having a complication. Um, but yes, especially the one you want to particularly pay attention attention to is with hypertension. Um, one of the more fatal and, um, you know, closely connected ones is that angina, which can lead to a heart attack. So we definitely want to watch for that, which speaking of which 
Let's talk about complications. So um, complications are usually surrounded around um, decreased perfusion to organs. So this, like, this is where I was talking about that just because I have high blood pressure doesn't mean I have good blood flow. Um, and so at the end of the day, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, pretty much what's happening is, is that there's these narrow constricted vessels that are, have all this pressure in them and that are trying to push blood to your organs. And because they are so constricted, they're actually bringing less blood to your organs, which means they're going to get less perfusion. So especially the kidneys are super selfish. They want all the, the flow in the world. And the second they stop getting flow, um, they usually get pretty upset and they fail because they're like, I'm not going to work for no blood. Um, and they're very um, selfish when it comes to blood flow. You can also go into heart failure because um, you're not getting that blood flow that you need to your heart. And so your heart muscle gets weak because it doesn't have the flow that it needs. Then you can have eye problems like retinopathy, um, those little micro hemorrhages in your eyes um, from the excess pressure. Um, it also can lead to, um, can create damage to blood vessels, um, cause, um, which can lead to blockages like coronary artery disease. Like I said, heart attack is really common with these patients with hypertension as a complication, um, stroke, um, peripheral artery disease. So it can affect my heart or my peripheral vessels. Um, and as a whole, like think of hypertension, think of like, Hey, it's kind of like think of pipes and that like pipes after a while, they get filled with junk. Um, they get really rigid and stiff and rusty and don't stop, start work. Uh, they stop working as well. That's what's happening in hypertension. So we're going to be worried about the pipes bringing the needed flow to my organs. Um, and then also the inside of them getting damaged and then plaques and other things accumulating, which again, leads to decreased flow or um, obstruction um, and um, things like heart attacks and stuff like that. Diagnostic testing, you know, the main test that we do is going to be checking a blood pressure and seeing what their baseline is. Um, and comparing it to maybe what it was before and seeing kind of where they ran and what the progression is. Um, we may rule out secondary causes of hypertension, looking for tumors, looking for, you know, kidney issues, looking for liver issues, um, uh, looking for thyroid issues, et cetera. There's a variety of things, but these are just a couple other tests we might do. Um, just if we're suspecting that maybe they have some other sort of, um, secondary cause of hypertension, like a tumor or um, organ failure or thyroid issues, endocrine disorders, stuff like that. So let's get into the gamut. There are a lot of medications. Try not to get overwhelmed by all of them. Um, you will need to know the classes and individual medications as well. So when you're learning and you're making flashcards, make sure to make some for the classes and make some for the individual meds as well. Um, when I say individual meds, just recognizing which meds are in which classes. Um, so in other words, on a test, we could give you and say, hey, a patient's getting a loop diuretic, or we could say, hey, a patient's taking furosemide. So you need to know the class and the name. I'm not saying you have to write down every single type of loop diuretic, but what I'm saying is you need to know what, which ones are loop diuretics, et cetera. Um, focus when you're studying for meds, focus less on the patho and more on what makes them different. So try to think about what are the things that makes this medication different than other ones. Um, and think of, um, as the nurse, what you're going to need to do before administration. Like, is there any labs you need to check any vital signs, um, during administration? Is there any special precautions then after, is there any labs that need to be monitored after any vital signs you need to check? Is there any teaching that needs to be given? Um, and like I have there, you know, think like there's a lot of, um, like different, different of these meds are going to need like different labs, um, and things like that to be monitored. Um, there's some that you have to check certain vital signs. Most of them, all of them, you're going to check blood pressure for, but some of them, you also need to check heart rate. Um, and then, um, how will you know the medication works? So, you know, so what's the expected effect? Obviously for most of it, it's going to be lower blood pressure. Um, so it's just kind of, um, keeping that in mind. Um, and then also know that a lot of these have a lot of stuff in uh, similar or the same. So all of these medications can cause decreased blood pressure and can lead to orthostasis. So focus on what teaching or management is different versus what is the same. So let's jump in. And so first I'm going to kind of talk about how each of these medications helps. So, um, let's start talking about diuretics. All right, so um, diuretics, they uh, are used for a couple different conditions. 
Um, diuretics help um, in the body because they help to get rid of, usually most people think, hey, they get rid of water. They consider there's like a water pill, but diuretics actually help to get rid of sodium and water. Um, and so this helps in two ways because if I have less sodium, less water can follow it. And then if I have less water, I have less pressure because remember water is volume, volume is stretch and stretch is pressure. Um, and so if I have less volume, remember that's one of the components of a good blood pressure. And so if I have too much volume, it can definitely help, um, it can definitely cause high blood pressure. So this helps to decrease volume. Um, so it can be used for hypertension, but we're also going to talk about in, the, in when it's used for heart failure. But the thing to keep in mind is they're used for two different purposes. When, I, when I'm giving a diuretic for heart failure, I'm trying to remove fluid because they have fluid in their lungs, they have fluid in their legs and their body, and they're just overwhelmed and they need less fluid because they can't breathe, they can't get up, move around. Um, and so I'm doing that to reduce the fluid load. Whereas when I'm giving it for hypertension, I'm giving it for less volume. Now, I, less volume, aka okay, less pressure. So in other words, what I want you to do, uh, what, what I want you to focus on here is let's say that you had a question that was talking about like, hey, you're giving furosemide for a patient with hypertension. What's the expected effect or expected outcome? And for hypertension, it's going to be to lower blood pressure. If it's for heart failure, it's going to be, hey, my lungs are clear. I have less fluid in my legs or less edema. Um, so it's just kind of knowing that. So in other words, when I'm giving diuretics for heart failure, I'm not giving it to lower their blood pressure. I'm giving it to lower the amount of fluid in their body. But when I'm giving it for hypertension, I'm giving it specifically for their blood pressure. So whenever you're reading a question, you always want to look at what disease process is it talking about? Because I can use one medication to treat many different problems um, or different disease processes, and it's going to help in different ways. Um, so um, the, the key here is just to always be very cautious when you're reading a question to see what is it really asking you, which disease process and, you know, how it's going to help. So again, for the expected effect for someone receiving diuretics for heart failure is going to be um, something like, you know, like, hey, their lungs are clear, that they've, um, you know, lost so much, um, so many pounds of weight, that they have less edema, stuff like that. I'm going to expect them to lose fluid because that's my goal is I have too much fluid, I want less fluid. For hypertension, I have too much pressure. So my expected, like think of expected effect is what am I hoping for for this patient? So for um, diuretics used for hypertension, my hope is, is that it's gonna lower their blood pressure. Another way to break this down is, and um, we'll talk about this when I talk about heart failure more, is like when I give a diuretic for heart failure, some students may say, hey, the expected effect is they're gonna pee because diuretics make you pee. Well, um, yes, I'm gonna expect that they're going to pee, but that's not what I'm hoping for. I'm not, I'm like, oh my goodness, I hope this patient pees like crazy crazy when they get this diuretic. Yes, I want their fluid off, but you know, you can't just look at someone's um, urine output and say, Hey, they're, they're doing better with this. The only way I can really know someone's doing better with their heart failure when it comes to um, if the diuretic is working is seeing how their fluid is. Like maybe their lungs were really wet and now they're clear. Maybe they had three plus edema. Now they have one plus edema. Maybe they were up three or four pounds. Now they're down a few pounds. Um, so it's all this stuff. Like I really want to be, what's the best measure to really see that it worked. And so same for hypertension. Um, you know, a patient can pee a lot with a diuretic, but that's not going to tell me that it's working for their hypertension. I know it's working for their hypertension if my end outcome, which is what I'm hoping for, which is low blood pressure is achieved. And so in other words, I'm sorry if I'm talking around in circles, but effectively you really just want to look at what do I want for this patient with a patient with high blood pressure? My goal is to have less pressure. And so um, the best way to measure that is to see what their blood pressure is. So I can tell a diuretic is effective for someone with hypertension by checking their blood pressure. So um, let's talk about the different types of diuretics. So there's what are known as potassium wasting diuretics, and then there's potassium sparing diuretics. So there's two potassium wasting diuretics. There's first what's known as thiazide diuretics, and there's also loop diuretics. So thiazide diuretics, these all end in thiazide or zide. And I have here that I have a lot of mnemonics through these meds. So I hope you enjoy some corny mnemonics, lots of fun. Um, it says, if you were in the zide mide nide zone, then no potassium will be home. So one way to remember it. Um, so like I mentioned, all these medications cause orthostatic hypotension. So as you're making your note cards, like orthostatic hypotension is not something worth putting on your note cards because it's going to be on every single one of them. In other words, there is no difference here. Um, uh, like none, none of these meds, 
all of these meds are going to cause orthostatic hypotension. So you don't really need to include that. Think about what's different. So what's different about thiazide diuretics is, is that they can lead to acid base imbalances like alkalosis, um, and then that they lower your potassium. So we need, we always want to know like, you know, Hey, okay, well, what am I going to be concerned about? Well, I need to know what a low potassium looks like. I need to know what a normal potassium level is. And, um, uh, what do you call them? If you, um, if you aren't familiar, a normal potassium is 3.5 to five, um, per the textbook that we use, uh, milli equivalents per liter. Um, so you, that's definitely a number you're going to want to know. And I think I have like labs and other things you need to know. I have a slide later on. Um, other teaching we want to give a patient that's on thiazide diuretics is, is that it may be um, dangerous with um, digoxin, um, and I'll talk more about that when I talk about digoxin, but effectively potassium and digoxin, um, they work opposite in this, and not work opposite, but they, um, they can affect each other. So in other words, if my potassium is low, um, it can make my digoxin more effective or it can make my digoxin levels higher. Um, so I'm going to be worried um, patients that are on on thiazide or loop diuretics um, that are potassium wasting and that are also taking digoxin. They can take them together, but I'm going to be worried about their digoxin being toxic. So I need to keep a close eye on that potassium. Um, NSAIDs um, also can, um, uh, what do you call them, affect, uh, what do you call them, the, they, can be, they can be dangerous with uh, diuretics. And then we're going to need to tell this patient since they are losing more potassium that we're going to need to supplement more potassium in their food. And I'll have another slide where I talk about what foods are high in potassium because a lot of teaching is going to be around, okay, here's the foods you need to eat if you're in potassium wasting diuretic. And then if you're in a potassium sparing diuretic, these are the foods that you need to avoid. And then for all diuretics, we want to tell them to take it in the morning. And this is because if I take a diuretic at night, what's a diuretic going to make me do? It's going to make me pee. I'm losing fluid through my urinary tract. Um, and so if I, um, if I take it at night, I'm going to be up all night peeing, which is going to uh, interrupt my sleep schedule. And then also because of that orthostasis and walking around in the dark late at night, it's just much more um, higher chance of me falling. It's really not safe. Um, so um, it's best to take it in the morning, even though a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to take it in the morning. I'm going to be peeing all day, but um, it's definitely going to help them. So the other type of diuretic is what's known as a loop diuretic. These are the most common you're gonna see given in the hospital. Um, and so this is like bumantanide or furosemide, terosemide, and um, this is a, these are very potent. So the cool thing about um, loop diuretics, something that's a little different about them, is that they work even when the kidneys are not at their best. So I could be in kidney failure or have be having kidney issues, um, and these can still be effective, which is great because um, all diuretics work through the kidneys. So um, you're going to want to check a kidney function on all of these patients on diuretics because um, the diuretics can negatively um, affect the, um, uh, we call it the ability for the kidneys to work. Um, so it's great because a lot of times people, like I said, kidneys are selfish organs, so they get their feelings hurt often and they shut down really quickly. And so it's great to have a diuretic that works, even if the kidneys are not working great. Um, just like the others, they're all going to have orthostatic hypotension. They're also going to be worried about electrolyte imbalances, specifically a decreased potassium. They also can affect magnesium as well, but, um, I would focus more on the potassium. So this is another potassium wasting. And, um, so I'm going to need to tell them to supplement extra potassium in their diet. Um, both thiazide and loop diuretics, they may end up having to actually take um, potassium supplements with this daily just to keep their potassium up. And just like the others, we're going to change positions slowly and take in the morning. Uh, but for your note card, something that's different in this one is ototoxicity. So um, when I'm giving an IV push, um, I always have to give this very slowly um, over a few minutes, follow your you know guidelines or whatever your MAR says. Um, but with ototoxicity, this is like a loss of hearing or an inability to hear as a result, because it can be like toxic or really um, harmful. Harmful, so you never want to push this fast. I always want to push it slow because um, it can have those detrimental side effects. On the opposite end, there are what are known as potassium sparing diuretics. These spare potassium's life and help to hold on to them. So some people, you're going to see some people that are on potassium wasting and potassium sparing because they help to balance each other out. Now, potassium sparing diuretics, um, they are a little bit weaker than the um, potassium uh, wasting ones. So these aren't usually used by themselves, but sometimes they are. Um, most of the time, they're going to need both or, um, you know, they're going to need extra help. They're not going to just be on this. And you're going to find this in general, that when people are on blood pressure meds, they're not on just one. They're usually on like three or four. And you're going to be like, man, this is a lot of meds. 
Um, so there's what are known as actually potassium sparing diuretics, and there's also what are called aldosterone receptor blockers. But just keep in mind, they have a different name, but they all they both spare potassium. Um, so here's some of the names and stuff like that, and I have my mnemonics there. Um, but the big thing to keep in mind with both of these um, is, is that they can cause that orthostatic hypotension, just like everything else. But the big difference here is they cause high potassium. They spare or they hold on to potassium. Um, and so... Um, High potassium is not good for people that are in kidney failure because they already can't get rid of the potassium and it can lead to really unsafe levels. So this is not good for people in kidney failure. Um, we don't want to take them with ACEs and ARBs. And um, I'll talk more about that later. But effectively, ACEs and ARBs also increase your potassium. So we definitely don't want to take those together. Um, no potassium supplements. And then something to keep in mind is, is that um, all of these is um, all of uh, all of the, these medications um, uh, sorry, all the people that are on these medications are usually going to be on a cardiovascular diet. Um, and so they're going to have like a low sodium diet. And so a lot of times what we use to replace that low sodium is salt substitutes like Mrs. Dash and what they use instead of salt is potassium. So something to keep in mind, like a lot of these patients are going to be it taking more potassium than they realize. So we just need to make sure that they're aware. It's not that they can't have Mrs. Dash, but we just have to monitor that potassium closely. And just like for the potassium wasting, they need to um, know the signs of low potassium for potassium sparing. They need to know the signs of high potassium. Um, and just like the other diuretics, we're going to take it in the morning. So, All right, so now getting to those foods um, that we want to either avoid or have more of, depending on what kind of diuretic we're on, we wanna know about what foods are high in potassium. Because um, again, for those that are on wasting um, diuretics like loop or thiazides, we want more of these. And then for those that um, are on potassium sparing or aldosterone receptor blockers, we want less of these. Um, so some common things, and there's more than this, but these are just a few common things are gonna be things like citrus juices, um, bananas, potatoes, fish, tomatoes, uh, beans, things like that. Um, so those are just some examples. So this is definitely what we want to include in our teaching for this patient. So um, let's go on and trust me this for a while, you're going to get overwhelmed. There's a lot of meds. <laughs> and so um, but again, just really be focusing and honing in on what's different. So try to highlight these and uh, mark what's different. Um, so first there's alpha one adrenergic, uh, or, so or should say next, <laughs> there's alpha one adrenergic blockers. Um, these are all the ZOs or the ZOS or the ZOSINs. Um, so um, for these, uh, they, um, uh, what do you call it? A, a, these, so we talked about, um, uh, what do you call it? With diuretics, they help because they lessen the amount of fluid and sodium that I have, which decreases my fluid load, which therefore lowers my blood pressure. Now we're going to get into adrenergic blockers like alpha and beta blockers. And these help a lot of times to reduce vasoconstriction. They stop the sympathetic nervous system from being activated, which helps to relax. And most of the alphas work mostly like the betas work more in the heart level, um, where the alphas work more in the vessel level. Um, so alphas help to relax smooth muscle in the blood vessels and allow them to, um, for there to be less constriction, less resistance, therefore less pressure. Um, anyway, alpha blockers um, are all the ZOs. And just like we had with other ones, they all cause orthostatic hypotension um, and um, can lower your blood pressure. Um, they also, these can lead to drowsiness. Um, so, um, you know, of course we're going to teach them to change positions slowly, but the thing that's different about this one is we usually want to tell them to take it at bedtime, especially that first dose, um, to decrease their risk of orthostasis. So, um, you know, um, the, the, the way that I remember this is you want to take your ZOS dose when your Z's will be close. So it has the Z in it. Um, just kind of remind you that this is the one you want to take near bedtime. Um, um, and so, cause that's going to help. So if I'm going to sleep, um, I'm not going to have as much orthostasis cause I'll be in bed, um, laying down and I won't have as much of that, um, happening. And also if it already makes me drowsy, it'll help so that, um, you know, I, I don't have those, uh, same detrimental effects during the day taking this. So then there's also alpha two. So there's alpha one blockers and there's alpha two adrenergic agonists. And even though these are agonists, they block adrenergic activity or they block that fight or flight and help to relax that, those blood vessels. So the most common one that you're gonna see in this class is what's known as clonidine. 
Um, and this can be given PO or it can be given in a patch. And so the story I always tell with this one is, is that um, I had a patient come in once and um, I guess the ER didn't, um, you know, take a look head to toe on them all the way. And they, um, uh, they, they got sent to my unit because they're like, oh, their blood pressure is super low. Um, they thought that they had an infection and had like shock and sepsis and all this other stuff going on. And I went to do my, um, you know, admission bath and like do a head to toe on them. And I, when I turned them over, there was like, four to five clonidine patches on their back. Now, why in the world they had four or five clonidine patches on? I don't know, but everyone's idea of fun is a little bit different. So I don't judge. Um, but uh, uh, wait, caught. sorry, that's my crazy cat. Hold on one second. Let me get this before um, one second. Sorry about that. My one cat has dementia and forgets that the other one lives here too. And they get in cat fights all the time. It's really not fun. So anyway, um, uh, pretty much with these alpha two agonists, I was talking about the, I was telling the story. So like this guy, he had these clonidine patches all over his back and why he did, I don't know. Um, but um, effectively um, it lowered his blood pressure. As soon as I took them off, his blood pressure came back up, he was fine. So um, at the end of the day, um, these can be very, very helpful. Um, those patches are super helpful. They work more long-term. So this is one that you may see often used in the hospital. Um, clonidine can also be used for a lot of other things like psychiatric conditions and stuff too. And a lot of these alpha two agonists, um, you might um, notice our um, meds that you might've learned about in your psychiatric class too. So it's amazing how things can work for many different purposes, but what makes clonidine different? So what makes it different? Again, it can cause that orthostasis, that dizziness, um, but this one can cause dry mouth too. It can have kind of a drying effect. So um, we can tell patients to use gum or hard candy to help to relieve their dry mouth. And we, um, it, because it can also lead to some drowsiness, we want to tell them not to take it with any other sedatives or anything else that's going to decrease their, um, uh, what do you call it, calls them to be more drowsy than what this might already cause them to be. Uh, and then we, uh, it can have a very, like all of these, if you stop them, you can have like hypertension coming back, but this one has a very severe rebound effect. And if I stop it suddenly that um, they can have a really severe, um, you know, intense hypertension or hypertensive crisis can come on. So we definitely want the, to tell them to not stop suddenly. Now in general, we're never going to tell a patient to stop any medicine suddenly, but just know what this one is especially dangerous. Um, and so, yeah, and there's a little mnemonic for you there if you like my mnemonics. So then there's beta blockers. And if you learn any medication this semester, you have to know about beta blockers. Almost all patients are on these for one reason or another. You're going to give this a million times in your life as a nurse, no matter where you work. Um, and if you don't, that's okay too. But I'm telling you, majority of people that are watching this video are going to become nurses um, that give a lot of beta blockers. Um, so I remember beta blockers give you lots of lows or um, LOLs because they all end in OLOL like atenolol, metoprolol, et cetera. Um, and so um, it lowers your blood pressure. And like I mentioned, some of them just lower your blood pressure, but some also lower your heart rate. So remember I said the alpha blockers work more in the blood vessels. This one has receptors in the heart, so it can actually affect your heart rate. Um, so we, um, we want to watch closely. And for this patient, we're going to need to check their blood pressure and their heart rate before for giving this. And usually we hold it if it's less than 60. So that's something that's special about this one. Um, the other consideration for beta blockers, and this goes for all beta blockers, the heart rate goes for all beta blockers. And this goes for all beta blockers is that if I'm diabetic and on a beta blocker, which you're going to see often, because a lot of diabetics also have cardiovascular disease, is that um, I'm going to need to be watching their blood sugar closely. They can totally receive a beta blocker. It's not that it's contraindicated, but I have to be super careful um, to um, uh, make sure that they're not going to have an unsafe drop in their blood pressure. Now, there are some studies that show that beta blockers themselves can lower blood blood glucose. But the reason we need to watch their blood glucose more closely is, is that beta blockers can mask the signs of hypoglycemia. And what I mean by that is, is that normally when my blood sugar gets low, like let's say I'm diabetic and my blood sugar drops, um, my body is going to show, like tell me that, hey, something's not right. And how does it tell me that? Uh, the, my fight or flight's activated. So when my blood glucose gets low, what happens is my body's like, hey, I don't have enough sugar. So my fight or flight's activated. My heart starts racing. 
sweating. Um, my, uh, what do you call it? I start sweating, getting diaphoretic. I'm having all this like a bear is chasing me kind of reaction. And that's my body trying to compensate for the low blood glucose, but it's also giving me a warning. Hey, go eat some candy. And so normally the body works really well to tell diabetics, Hey, you need some candy. And they say, Oh my goodness, I'm getting sweaty. Uh, my heart's racing. I need to go um, eat something. My blood sugar must be low. But when, um, when we're using beta blockers, we're blocking the sympathetic nervous system. So if I'm blocking the sympathetic nervous system, they're not going to have that same reaction or their body's not going to be able to tell them, oh, hey, wait, did you notice that your blood sugar is low? Um, so, um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, what do you call it as a whole, when I'm saying that it masks the signs of hypoglycemia, normally um, a diabetic is going to be able to recognize when they're hypoglycemic. Usually most diabetics can, um, but beta blockers are going to block the messages my body's trying to tell me to say, hey, eat some candy. And so these patients, they could have a low blood glucose and not know it because they don't have that same fight or flight reaction because we're blocking it um, with these antihypertensives. So beta blockers, great for hypertension, um, but not good if I'm hypoglycemic because I'm not going to have that same reaction. So it's great that I'm not fight or flighting it all the time, but it's not good when I need to fight or flight it like when I'm hypoglycemic. Um, so there's a couple different types of beta blockers. There's what's known as cardioselective and then non-cardioselective. And what I mean by this is that there are beta cells, and I'm not going to get too deep in this, but there's beta cells in different areas of your body. And for cardioselective, these medications, the it, it works on the beta cells that are mostly in the heart. And this is the kind that's preferred because... Um, you know, uh, we're going to need to do like what I mentioned, caution with those with diabetes, take your pulse before change position slowly, all the, the, the stuff that we've already talked about. Um, but they're pretty safe because they only really work in the heart, which is what we're hoping for. But there's also what are known as non cardio selective. And um, the, with these medications, they have the same stuff we need to worry with diabetes, we need to change position slowly, take the pulse before hold if it's less than 60. But the thing that's different here is non cardio selective, they work on beta cells that are in the heart and in the lungs. And by doing this, what can happen is when they block that they can actually lead to uh, bronchospasm or bronchoconstriction. So um, these medications are a little dangerous for patients that have constrictive airway disease like asthma and COPD. Um, so definitely I want to know my patient's history before giving this. And I probably want to bring that up with the doctor because it may not be safe for them to take this medication. Um, so a lot of students are like, how am I going to remember the difference between cardio selective and non cardio selective? Well, someone found this um, pretty cool trick that all beta blockers that start with A through M as in monkey um, are going to be cardio selective. So atenolol to metoprolol are going to be cardio selective where anything N as in Nancy through Z is going to be non cardio selective like propranolol. Um, so a propranolol and natalol, things like that are all non cardio selective. Um, more nine times out of 10, we give the cardio selective kinds, but um, we do sometimes give non cardio selective. And of course, to keep things spicy, there's also mixed alpha and beta. So these are a mix of not only just beta blockers, but alpha blockers. Um, I talked about how compliance is an issue in hypertension. Um, so we definitely have to um, keep a close eye on these uh, patients and make sure that they're keeping up with their um, regimens. And one way we can do that is combining some of their medications. So I can get that mixed, um, you know, um, relaxation of the blood vessels, plus that, that, you know, decrease in the heart rate and stuff like that, or that decrease in the sympathetic nervous system, kind of a combined synergistic effect. Instead of having to take um, two separate pills, I can just take one. Um, so, and these don't fall, these, these two do not fall into that rule because these are mixed. And since they're mixed, they're going to be non cardio selective. So I know I said A through M is going to be cardio selective, but carvedilol and labetalol are mixed. And they're the exception to the rule that because they are um, dangerous for those that have constrictive airway or respiratory disease, but you can see everything else is the same. So I know there's a lot on this page, but just keep in mind all beta blockers. Um, caution with diabetics, take your pulse before, change position slowly, hold if your heart rate's less than 60. Um, cardio selective, um, there's nothing special there, just those things I just mentioned. Non cardio selective, I'm also worried and mixed. Um, alpha and beta, I'm also worried about people with um, constrictive airway or respiratory disease like COPD and asthma. So, pretty much of diabetics, um, you know, watch blood sugar closely for all of them, watch heart rate closely for all of them, change positions closely for uh, slowly for all of them. Um, but then just for the non cardio selective and mixed alpha and beta, we need to watch that um, watch their history of constrictive airway disease because these may not be safe. Hopefully that's clear.
All right, so now let's talk about vasodilators. They're what known as direct vasodilators. These help to open blood vessels. So this is kind of going back to that, um, what I talked about, like if you're um, very vasoconstricted, like if you are a funnel, um, and I'm trying to pour milk into a funnel and um, you're super, super narrow, it's gonna be a lot harder and there's a lot more resistance. So vasodilators open up or decrease some of that resistance, decreasing that um, systemic vascular resistance, which lowers blood pressure. Um, and then the heart doesn't have to work so hard to pump that blood forward. So um, direct vasodilators examples are going to be, um, you know, and a lot of people think of nitrates um, and there are nitrates like mononitrate or dinitrate or the isozorbide medications. Um, and so those are true. I'm not talking about actually nitroglycerin. That's different. That's not usually used for blood pressure, the kind that we give orally at least. Um, so when I'm talking about direct vasodilators, I'm talking about hydrolazine and the isozorbide mononitrates and dinitrates. Um, so um, direct vasodilators, are great at lowering blood pressure, decreasing resistance, but they can cause a massive hypotension. Like all of these are gonna lower your blood pressure, all these meds we've talked about, but especially direct vasodilators, these cause a super hypotension. Um, they also, um, with the nitrates, there can be flushing, dizziness, and headache. So just something to know. So um, some special things about direct vasodilators um, is that we want to make sure that we monitor their weight, but because pretty much, um, with vasodilation, we want vasodilation. We like, we, we, I don't want to say we want vasodilation. We like open our arteries and things to be open. We like good blood flow, but we need so much constriction to get blood to pump back where it's supposed to go. Um, so when I think I've talked about in other videos, vasodilation, think pooling of blood. Um, and so what can happen is, especially um, with patients that take these regularly, they can get um, increases in their weight or fluid accumulation because blood starts pooling because they have this vasodilation. So I need to monitor their weight closely. Um, but then also, these are not safe to use with erectile dysfunction drugs. And all erectile dysfunction drugs um, end in fill, F-I-L. And I always think, like, you can remember, hey, these are going to fill me up and but um, bump um, there for you. So, but um, the thing is erectile dysfunction drugs are actually vasodilators in themselves, which makes sense. If I'm trying to get an erection, um, what I need is blood flow. And so I need um, good blood flow. So vasodilators help to allow for men to get these, um, uh, to get a better erection um, through this vasodilation. Um, and I'm not an expert on that. So if I'm saying that wrong and you know better than me, then you can keep that to yourself because I'm not trying to become an erectile dysfunction medication expert, but that is my understanding. Um, but keep in mind this, this is what I do know. Erectile dysfunction meds used to, um, like they were originally marketed to be blood pressure meds, but they found out that they would make more money, um, uh, selling uh, for as erectile dysfunction meds than they would as blood pressure meds because they know that you know people are going to pay big money for erectile dysfunction drugs so that's what happened there so effectively we don't want to give two medications that are the same medication so I don't want to give um, two vasodilators if I give hydrolazine and an erectile dysfunction med that is double this massive hypotension I know I talked before that you can give two diuretics so you can give two diuretics together there's a lot of meds like I can give alpha and beta medications together. I can give beta blockers and a vasodilator. I could give a diuretic and a beta blocker. Um, so th these are those aren't ones that necessarily interact. We can give multiple meds together, but we usually don't want to give two in the same class together. And this especially applies for vasodilators because there's just that extreme reaction. I'm also going to talk about ACE inhibitors and ARBs. And these are two different um, that two classes that do the same thing. And it's the same thing for them. We don't want to give an ACE and an ARB together because they're going to have too much of the same effect, which can lead to deadly consequences. Now um, with um, diuretics, it's a little different. They can have a potassium sparing and not potassium sparing because they work synergistically together. So it's a little bit different there. So um, what do you call it? Um, hold on one second. I'm sorry for all the pauses. All right, let's get back to it. So now let's talk about, and we're almost there. I promise, I think I only have like two more classes. So let's talk about ACEs and ARBs. So ACE inhibitors and ARBs, they block what's called the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So remember when I told you the kidneys are selfish, they want tons of blood flow. Um, what happens is that when the kidneys don't get blood flow, they simulate the sympathetic nervous system and they stimulate the RAS. And just as a reminder of what the RAS does, 
um, effectively, um, the this system causes you to hold on to more sodium and more water, um, which then leads you to have um, more volume, and then um, it constricts your blood vessels. So this is this is a great like the renin angiotensin aldosterone system is great if my blood pressure is actually low or I'm low on volume and I need more. So this is like a great like fail safe. Like my kidneys are super smart and they're like, hey, I I'm not getting as much flow. I must need more volume. I must need more pressure. Um, so they stimulate this to try to get more volume or more pressure. And like I said, that's great if I actually was low on volume and pressure. But with hypertension, a lot of times I have too much volume. I have too much pressure, too much constriction, and this is going to make it worse. So um, it, ACE inhibitors and ARBs can block that. Um, they block that rest. And so what's the outcome there? I'm going to have less sodium accumulation, um, less fluid um, uh, retention. Um, and I'm going to have less vasoconstriction. In other words, it's not a vasodilator, but it's going to stop me from constricting so much. So um, the key here um, to remember too is, is that sodium and potassium work opposite. Um, so normally with the RAS, like when I'm stimulating the RAS, because I want more sodium and more water, um, I'm holding on to sodium. So I'm wasting a lot of potassium. So normally the RAS makes me lose potassium. But if I'm blocking that, this is going to cause me to hold on to potassium because I'm going to be letting go of sodium, therefore holding on to potassium, which brings us to a lot of what we talk about with ACE inhibitors. So these are two separate classes. I'll talk about how they're different. Um, so the ACE inhibitors, they all end in pril, and I always remember prills will make your blood pressure chill. Um, these cause the orthostatic hypotension, just like the others, but here's some things that are different. Um, the ACE inhibitors are well known for causing a cough. That's why I have ACE, a cough is expected. Um, but here's the thing, this is kind of like with the cholesterol, which I don't think I've talked about cholesterol meds yet. No, I haven't talked about cholesterol meds yet. Um, so with, um, I'm gonna talk about them later in um, the second part of this lecture. Um, but um, cholesterol, there's uh, you know statins, that's a cholesterol med, they can lead where they can cause you to have um, like you, it's expected to have some muscle pain, but it's also needs to be reported. So this is one of those cases. So a cough is expected. If people have a cough, um, part of when um, angiotensin one turns into angiotensin two in that RAS, um, it's in the lungs. And so the cough is expected because um, of just that what's happening at the, the cell level that's going on there. But for some people, it can be a sign of angioedema or like a very severe reaction. And for some people, it's just a nagging symptom. Like I said, remember, think about these patients. They they have high blood pressure, but they're not having these symptoms aside from a number on a screen. And then you're making them take a medicine that's causing them to cough constantly every day. What do you think they're going to want to do? Probably not take that medicine because they're not having any symptoms without the medicine. They're only having symptoms with the medicine. Um, so we need to report it because the thing is, is if they're having the cough, it could be serious reaction. It could be nothing, but there's an, uh, there's an option where they cannot have the cough. And that's what ARBs or angiotensin receptor blockers are, but I'll talk about that in a minute. But anyway, so, um, um, a cough is expected, so it's not like a scary symptom usually, but it is something that needs to be reported. Um, also, this go, um, this works on the kidney, so it can um, affect kidney function and make um, uh, have uh, increased creatinine, which is there, which is decreased kidney function. Um, so when I said, what labs do we use to measure kidney function? The best lab is going to be the serum creatinine. And the normal is like around 0.6 to 1.3 is what you want to remember. Um, and so we need to monitor that closely because we definitely do not want to um, be hurting their kidneys. Um, and so then um, the other thing is, like I mentioned, because we're blocking the RAS, we're going to be letting go of sodium, therefore holding on to potassium. So they can have this, um, uh, what do you call it, um, this uh, really extreme, um, or not extreme, but they can have a higher potassium. So some of the teaching I need to do is going to be avoiding things that increase potassium. So this is why this is not safe with potassium sparing diuretics, because both of them can increase your potassium. Um, I also don't want to take them with potassium supplements or those salt substitutes that have that increased amount of potassium in them. Um, so um, as a whole, ACE inhibitors, um, they block the RAS, which can lead to this nagging cough, which should be reported just so that we make sure they stay compliant and that they're not having that dangerous angioedema reaction. Um, we need to watch their kidneys and their potassium level closely and don't want to do anything to increase their potassium level. Um, so then there's ARBs and these are in the same class. That's why I was saying we don't want to give these two like together. Like I don't, a patient's not going to be on an ACE and an ARB because both of them are going to increase my potassium. So angiotensin receptor blockers, they have the same side effects as 
ACE inhibitors, except there's no cough. So these work after the lungs um, in, that, um, in that reaction. And so they do not, um, uh, they don't cause that same cough. So if a patient's having a cough with an ACE inhibitor, we can switch them to an angiotensin receptor blocker. They don't have to have that nagging cough. Um, the downside to angiotensin receptor blockers is, you know, they're not like ACE inhibitors are definitely a little bit more potent um, and they work quicker. Like these can take three to six weeks to start working. So that's why they're not as preferred to the ACE inhibitors. Uh, but <clears throat> same possible reaction. So we definitely want to, um, you know, let make sure that we're watching their potassium, watching their kidney function, watching for any sort of reaction. Um, so you can take in the, all of these in insartin. So I always remember take a sartin to stop the cough from starting. You like it? Pretty fun, right? I know you're tired of me by now, but don't worry. Eventually I stop talking. Um, so um, anyway, last but not least, the last class that I'm going to talk about is calcium channel blockers. So there's what are known, of course, everything has to have classes. Um, there's non-dihydropyridines and dihydropyridines. And the non-dihydropyridines are, I wouldn't focus so much on these ones. These ones are used more for dysrhythmias. They slow your heart rate and they can convert your um, rhythm. These aren't really used for hypertension. They're used for um, people in like atrial fibrillation, et cetera. Um, they um, have the same, uh, like, you know, they're going to, um, this is another one that works again on, um, on your heart level. Like, so calcium channel blockers are like, they're, they vasodilate in your periphery, um, and then they also can affect, um, uh, what do you call it, your conduction and in your heart, so they can lower your heart rate. So this is another one that I'm going to want to do heart rate and blood pressure. Um, and then the other stuff is all the same when it comes to they have orthostatic hypotension, dizziness, and stuff like that. But like I said, I wouldn't focus too much on the non-dihydropyridines for if you're in, um, in our school at our level. I can't speak if you're watching this and you go to a different school. Um, the most common when we're talking about hypertension meds and calcium channel blockers is what's known as amlodipine, um, and so also known as Norvasc. Um, <clears throat> it helps, um, it helps, like I said, to um, vasodilate, relax the blood vessels and stuff like this. But as a result of that, because it has that vasodilation effect, they can have swelling, uh, swelling, swelling in their lower extremities. Um, so we want to watch their weight closely. Um, uh, and then the other symptom that they can have is what's known as gingival hyperplasia, which is where their gums um, kind of get this real like um, thick quality to them, or they literally get extra tissue in their gums um, can lead to some problems. So we want to teach them very good dental hygiene. So the two things that are different about calcium channel blockers, we want to check the heart rate and the blood pressure. Um, uh, we want to make sure to look for that lower dimity, uh, lower extremity, a dimity, ah, that's funny, um, lower extremity swelling, and then also really good dental hygiene and watching out for that gingival hyperplasia. Um, so getting down to numbers, um, we always want to know the client's normal blood pressure. I got to take a real quick pause. Hold on. All right, hopefully the last pause. We're almost there. I'm going to take a pause after hypertension and split this into two because it's a this is a long lecture. Um, so um, getting down to numbers with hypertension medications, we always want to know patients' normal blood pressure. So we always want to know um, like what their baseline is. So for some people, like you know, we can sit there and their blood pressure is 160, and they're like, "Oh, this is great." Usually, I'm 190. Um, so we always want to know where they're at. I'm not saying we're going to be okay with 160, but it's good to know like kind of what their trends are. Um, we always give medications, even if blood pressure is normal. So um, like normally, um, and I've seen this happen, like some nurses, they're going to hold medications because they're like, oh, their blood pressure is 120 over something. They don't need their blood pressure med. But you have to keep in mind, maybe their blood pressure is good because they're getting their meds. So we can only hold blood pressure meds if we're following parameters. And those parameters are usually if their systolic blood pressure is less than 100 or heart rate less than 60 for beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. Um, so just keep in mind that like we can never just hold decide like practice medicine and say, hey, I'm going to hold this medicine because I don't think the patient needs it. Um, you have to always be following parameters or talk to your doctor, et cetera. Now your doctor may be okay with it. Or maybe like, I know it's, it's scary sometimes as a nurse, you're giving like four blood pressure meds and you're like, oh my God, this is a lot of medication, but just keep in mind, they're probably on that because they have very resistant hypertension. They probably need all those medications. Um, but sometimes it's, there's some trial and error there and you have to get comfortable with it, but just know that we, they need these medications regardless of how they're like, again, there's no symptoms. It's just the number on that screen. Um, you need to know your potassium normals, that 3.5 to 5, especially for your loop diuretics. 
um, not your libtard, all diuretics, and then your ACE inhibitors and ARBs. I um, mean, you need to know kidney function, especially for your, um, for your um, diuretics, as well as for your um, ACEs and ARBs. The normal is 0 0.6. I have to 1.2. I think I said 1.3 before, but um, yeah, 0 0.6 to 1.2 or 1.3. I promise we will not have something super tricky. That's like, right, like it's 1.3. Um, it will be something uh, much farther from normal. Um, and then you also need to know your client's history and monitor the parameters, like with diabetes, what's their blood glucose? Um, we were, we're always going to be worried about it being low and like masking those signs, especially with beta blockers and then um, restrictive airway disease. If they're on non-selective beta blockers, non-cardio selective beta blockers or mixed alpha betas, we're going to be worried about restrictive airway disease. Like what is their history? Are they getting good oxygen? Are they having any bronchospasms? So um, those are just some um, numbers and things you want to consider uh, when you are um, giving these medications and as you're studying for these kind of connecting those dots together. So um, lifestyle changes. So we want to um, um, encourage these people to lose weight. It can definitely help with their, uh, with, I was going to say with their symptoms, but with their blood pressure, because they don't have any symptoms. Um, the DASH diet, which I'll talk about on the next slide is uh, recommended. Um, it's generally like a heart healthy diet. We want them to limit their sodium intake, usually about a half a gram or less. Um, decreasing their alcohol intake, increasing their physical activity is helpful. Um, uh, these are all irritants and can um, make changes in the blood vessels. So increased physical activity can help with weight loss. It can help decrease stress. There's lots of stuff. I'm going to talk about that too. Um, tobacco products are harmful to the blood vessels. They cause constriction. We definitely want them to stay away from that vasoconstriction. Um, and then managing stress. Like there's very, um, you know, most people would be thinking about, oh, I just need to focus on taking my medicines. Yes. But if you're stressing yourself out all the time, um, you know, no matter how many meds you take, your body's constantly in that like crazy mode. You can take all the beta blockers in the world, but you can't over overtake the fact that you're, if you're constantly stressed, not sleeping, not taking care of yourself, AKA nursing school. Um, so definitely it's a balance. And then fish oil is also healthy and helpful. Um, so the DASH diet is things like what you would consider to be healthy, like whole grains, vegetables, fruits. Um, usually a lot of cardiovascular diets going to be low fat or fat free um, choices, things like beans, nuts, and seeds, um, lean meats like chicken is good and fish, and then healthy fats and oils are good for these patients. Um, exercise recommendations. We usually, um, like I said, like there's lots of benefits. It lowers your blood pressure, um, helps promote relaxation. It decreases and helps to control weight, decrease stress. Um, all of these things are helpful for these patients because uh, managing hypertension is not just about the meds. It's about the lifestyle. You have to do both together. And you're going to hear this, me say this over and over. We can like, you cannot outrun a bad lifestyle. Um, and so with medications alone. Um, so usually what we want for exercise is moderate intensity, um, uh, aerobic activity is about 30 minutes, five days a week. Um, and so moderate activity is like, if you're walking on a treadmill and you can't really talk and walk at the same time, that's moderate. If you can sit there and read a book, crochet or knit um, a scarf, it's probably not moderate activity unless, or moderate intensity, unless you're just really um, an intense person. Um, <coughs> so uh, muscle strengthening exercises, flexibility and balance is good. Um, you know, we really want people to find activities that they're going to enjoy um, at their activity level. They shouldn't be like starting a new like running program and they've never ran before in their life. We want to increase their activity levels gradually. Walking is a great activity for these patients. Um, so general education, there's no cure for hypertension, but it's manageable. Um, and so um, this is something that requires management, even if they're not having symptoms or don't really feel um, like they need this to be managed. Um, medication compliance is so key for these patients because again, they're not, they don't feel like they need to take their medicine a lot of the times because they're like, hey, I'm not having any symptoms. I feel fine. The medication causes more problems than what um, I feel like when I'm not taking it. Um, but there's damage going on and or just decreased per, uh, perfusion to organs and so much more going on, even if they're not feeling it. It's like diabetes, where sometimes you have the complications before you have the actual like diagnosis of diabetes. Um, every patient should learn what their blood pressure should be and when they should be worried. And every client might have different goals. Um, so just um, encouraging them to have conversations with their doctor and know what their normal is. Um, no, um, I'm going to talk about how to monitor or measure blood pressure in the next slide. Um, but home blood pressure monitoring is key for these patients and they should track their blood pressure, look for trends, see what's affecting it, what's working, what's not, because um, they can build up tolerance to medications. They can eventually need more and more medications. 
um, with medications, they should take it. Even if their blood pressure is okay, they should not be self-dosing or saying, I'm going to take half a pill. I'm going to double up my dose, any of that stuff. They should never stop taking suddenly. They should never take someone else's meds if they run out of theirs, um, you know, and um, never changing their dose at all. So they should always talk to their doctor first. And I know some of this stuff seems like common sense, but you'd be surprised how many people are like, Hey, do you take Carvedilol too? Do you got an extra, you know? <laughs> and so um, you definitely want to be careful because some people mix around with these things. I even, I had a patient once at um, J GPS that um, they, um, uh, what do you call them? Um, uh, they said like uh, they were having like really bad pain or something. And so that they went to their, their drug dealer and their drug dealer, like um, they just like, they trusted their drug dealer to give them something to help with their pain. And the, the drug dealer gave them a beta blocker and to the point where they ended up in like a really bad heart block or something like that. <laughs> so just now, like, I mean, like they should, they shouldn't be drugs that are like, you know, out on the street being sold, <laughs> but you know, sometimes desperate times call for desperate measures. So just always know that um, you just never know when those beta blockers are going to become the next the next thing on the street. So last but not least, um, measuring blood pressure takeaways. Um, so like how uh, th this is just some general principles to taking a blood pressure, make sure that you have the correct size and the blood pressure is done under the clothes. So it shouldn't be done over the clothes because it can't it's not as accurate. Um, what do you call it? If a cup is too small, you can get a false high reading. If a cup is too big, you can get a false low reading. And you can look at the cups and it shows you how to measure to see that it's the right size. But most of the time you can look and see, oh, that's too big, that's too small. And this might be an inconvenience to go get the right size, but trust me, you want to do it to get that accurate reading. Make sure the arm is supported. So we want it at heart level. We don't want it dangling down by the body or up. And you know, some people, they sit there and they hold it up in the air. You don't need to be doing that. Um, heart level, just straight up, um, supported on a table or something like that. Um, check to make sure there's no limb precaution. So, um, you know, if they have a pick line, dialysis access, um, maybe if they've had a history of mastectomy and we're worried about lymph node damage or some trauma to the limb, we may not be able to use a certain side. So most hospitals have a band they'll put on the patients that says like, hey, this is a restricted limb, et cetera. Um, but just kind of keep an eye on that um, and make sure that you're checking that. Because uh, some patients, like sometimes doctors even just don't want to use a limb um, because of um, they're concerned about um, like in the future, they might need it for a dialysis access or something. So definitely keep an eye on that and make sure that you're using a limb that's safe to use. Um, take the blood pressure at an optimal time, usually after resting. So like, don't be stressing the patient out, having them do all this stuff running around and then trying to take their blood pressure right away. Let them chill out for a minute, rest, make sure their stress level's not too high or not in pain. Cause you know, you're probably not going to get an accurate reading. Um, ask the patient not to talk while taking their blood pressure. I know that sometimes they ask you, like you end up saying like, oh, so are you here? How are you doing? How old are your kids? Blah, blah, blah. That's not the time to ask those questions. Let their blood pressure take and then talk to them. Cause you know, it's kind of like at the dentist when they're like, hey, how are things going? And then they stick something in your mouth and you're like, did you really want to know? Cause you just stuck something in my mouth after asking me a question. But anyway, that's a whole other story. Um, but um, what do you call them? We definitely want them not to talk. Um, if their legs are crossed, it can affect their blood pressure. So uncross their legs. Um, there really shouldn't be a difference between the right and the left side. Um, and so if there is, it might indicate a bigger problem. And then you always want to chart where you took it because there could be differences. And just so that they know, hey, this was taken in the leg because there's very big differences between the blood pressure in the leg than the arm. And then this um, picture just tells you a little bit about, um, you know, how diff like the reading can be off by this many points, um, just based on these things. So you definitely want to make sure that you set the patient up. They're not stressed, not talking. Um, we're doing it on the on the a correct side. That is, um, <coughs> sorry about that. Um, a correct side that is not doesn't have any precautions. That is the good cuff size. Their arm is supported. Um, their legs are uncrossed, and that um, we are charting where we did that blood pressure. I want to teach them how to take it at home too, so that they're taking their medications accurately and not underdosing or overdosing themselves, um, you know, based on that. So anyway, I'm going to stop here because this is um, coronary artery disease and um, chronic stable angina have a lot too. So I'm going to stop here because this has been a lot of talking and I'll do a part two for this lecture. I'll see you there.